Awesome, we'll get started. So thank you all for joining us today for our second webinar on the International Savannah Fire Management Initiative. We're meeting at a slightly different time this month so we can hear from Ari Godning, Goring and Sam Johnston down south in Australia. So thank you all for being here today. Uh, before I introduce our speakers, I'd like to cover a couple of housekeeping topics. Today's webinar is being recorded. We'll share the link to the recording on the PyroLife website and YouTube channel. We'll also share a written summary on the blog section of our website. We welcome you to revisit the presentation and share it with anyone who may have missed out today. If you're talking about the webinar on social media, please feel free to use the official hashtag PyroLife webinars. We really encourage all your comments and questions throughout the presentations. Your audio and video are turned off, but you'll see at the bottom of your screen, there's a Q&A chat box. So you can use that function to ask any questions for the speakers. If you can, please send any questions in as you think of them. So we've got them all lined up and ready to go for the QA session, which we'll have at the end of the presentations. Sam and Ari are really keen to engage with you all and we've made sure to leave plenty of time at the end for all of your questions. So um, I really encourage you all to take the opportunity to engage with and learn more from our speakers today. We have people listening in from all corners of the globe and we really welcome you to ask your questions in your native tongue. We'll be able to translate these to ask our speakers and the answers will be given in English. I should also introduce myself as your webinar moderator today. My name is Kieran Little. I'm based at the University of Birmingham and my research with PyroLife focuses on how fuel moisture content changes across a landscape and what that means for constructing functional fire danger rating systems. I'm really excited to introduce today's speakers, Ari Goring and Sam Johnston from the International Savannah Fire Management Initiative. Our first speaker today is Ari, who has over 20 years experience working with the Kimberley Land Council in indigenous lead cultural conservation. Area has worked with partners to establish a system of indigenous protected areas in the Kimberley region, covering 90,000 square kilometers, which to give you a bit of context is a quarter of the region. This is managed by the Kimberley Ranger Network who employ more than 100 indigenous cultural conservation managers. Area also recently led the registration of the North Kimberley Fire Abatement Project, which is now an indigenous owned Savannah Carbon Project. Our second speaker today is Sam, who developed, managed and successfully delivered the first phase of the feasibility study for the initiative. He's worked on this technology all around the world now for over a decade. On top of this, Sam is a qualified legal practitioner in Australia and has 29 years of legal experience in many developed and developing countries, as well as 25 years experience in international legal practice including for the United Nations. Ari and Sam, thank you both so much for joining us. We're really lucky to have you here today. So at this time, I'm going to hand the floor over to Ari, who's going to start today's presentation. So Ari, uh, go ahead and share your screen when you're ready. Great, thank you, Karen. And I will uh, just share my screen. Can you um, see my can you see my screen on the um Yes, it's looking perfect. Thanks. Great. I'll just check and see if I can. Uh, so I'm just looking for my notes. I haven't come up in the screen. Um, go through. So I'm thank you for that wonderful introduction, Karen. Uh, my name is Ariadne Goring and as Karen mentioned, I spent over 20 years living and working in the Kimberley region for an organisation, an Aboriginal organisation called the Kimberley Land Council. Um, and more recently, I have moved to Melbourne to head up a new foundation called Pollination Foundation. Uh, and we focus on 
accelerating community-based uh, enterprise and climate solutions. Um, but today I'm going to tell the story of uh, our work in the Kimberley and link it to um, my work with Sam that I've been uh, working with for the last five, six years um, on the International Savannah Fire Management Initiative. Um, and so I'll start by saying that I am here on the lands of the Kulin Nations on Boon Warung country in South Melbourne. And I pay my respects to the elders uh, to the leaders of today and to the future generations and acknowledge that through their wisdom and their leadership, we all get to enjoy and be uh, on this amazing country here in Australia. Um, so, you know, here in Australia, Aboriginal people historically um, managed fire uh, and they farmed the landscape using what we call today a fire stick farming technique. Um, but as colonisation came, people were moved off country and this, uh, these practices became less frequent. And what we've seen in Australia and what you would have seen, uh, particularly in the news, is these huge catalytic wildfires that um, uh, you know, burn up country because there's these huge fuel loads that uh, accumulate over time uh, and then wildfire comes in and, and we see these huge catalytic wildfires. And so when um, Australia was colonised in 1788, what the colonisers didn't see with their Western lens and their views um, that they brought with them was that the Australian continent was managed and was uh, farmed using fire. Um, and what the British brought with them was very much a Western uh, way and approach of managing fire, which meant that a fire was suppressed. Um, and so we saw a huge change in the fire regimes here in Australia. And so you can see from this Tanya map in 1788, Australia was managed by indigenous peoples. Um, it wasn't until 1992 when the Native Title Act was brought into Australia that we started to see a recognition of traditional land rights uh, and Aboriginal people's practices and connection to country being acknowledged. Um, and you can see now over time that the tenure is starting to um, change and the tenure systems are starting to change and a re-emergence of traditional land management practices with with the change in tenure and the recognition of Indigenous rights. Um, and so today I will share a story of the Kimberley. The Kimberley is in the northwest of Australia uh, and it is it covers an area that's equivalent to the size of the state of California. 97% um, of the region is classified as very remote. There's a population of about 40,000 people, half of which are Indigenous or Aboriginal. Um, and it's recognised as one of the most sparsely populated places in the world. There's about 30 different languages spoken by Aboriginal people in the region. Um, and there's over 100 remote Aboriginal communities. Across the region, there is um, this network that has emerged based on the recognition of, of traditional uh, people's connection to country and their land rights. Um, and there's this network that has emerged of 13 distinct um, indigenous nations uh, who have caring for country, what we call indigenous rangers. Uh, and those rangers, do both cultural and conservation activities. Uh, they're financed and funded through an Australian government program called Working on Country. Um, and the other thing that this map shows us, which is a little bit harder to tell, but you can see a network there emerging um, in, the, in the different shaded colours of Indigenous protected areas, which is what we essentially call um, an Aboriginal national park. And those areas are identified as having both cultural and conservation significance and protected under the IUCN protected areas categories. 
uh, and they cover an area about the size of Belgium, um, which is solely managed by Indigenous groups. And as I mentioned, each of those protected areas and a lot of the ranger groups uh, has a plan of management that um, we call here in Australia a healthy country plan. And that guides the activities and it guides the work that the rangers and traditional owners uh, do on country. And a really important aspect of the work uh, and why it's so important is that, as you can see up in the photo there, the Ungud Rangers, they have a very deep connection, uh, cultural connection to their country. Country's alive um, and they see themselves as a part of nature, not separate from nature. Uh, so when country's healthy, people are healthy and it's very much a reciprocal um, relationship. And so hot fires and destructive wildfire not only has an impact um, on nature, but also on people. So it was probably about in 2004, a group not in the Kimberley region, but in the neighbouring state, Northern Territory, um, started to talk about how reintroducing this fire stick farming practice back into the landscape uh, could also reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and the scientists started to work with the Aboriginal uh, senior cultural elders and they talked about researching and understanding uh, how they could calculate for the re reductions in greenhouse gas emissions by reintroducing fire stick farming. And that research program um, took hold. There was a company, Conoco Phillips, that voluntarily invested um, funds to uh, receive offsets. From, from reducing carbon emissions. And through that then led to government investing funds and other um, not-for-profit big NGOs investing funds to prove up this carbon method. And that method now um, supports over, I think there's more than 25 indigenous fire projects registered across Northern Australia. Um, but this project in the North Kimberley, the one that I've worked on, uh, covers an area of 3.2 million hectares. Um, there are four Indigenous nations that registered these uh, Savannah Fire Carbon projects. It employs more than 40 traditional owners every year or 40 rangers every year to manage the fire operations. Um, and they spend like more than 70 days out on country, camping on country. And they combine both their cultural knowledge with new technology to do their fire planning work. And this is just a tenure map. I think I spoke to the tenure earlier. And I think as a lot of you know, fire doesn't stop at a boundary but tenure is very important in terms of who has the right to manage fire um, on different areas. And you can see there also the rainfall zones. So the Savannah fire method is most, uh, generates the most carbon offsets in the above the 1000 mil rainfall zone. Um, and then from between the 600 to the um, 900 mil rainfall zone, uh, you can still register projects within that area but they produce less carbon. So the rainfall has a huge impact on the vegetation type, which then impacts the amount of carbon that is abated from reintroducing traditional fire management. And then where you can, where indigenous groups can register a project is very much linked to land tenure. And so you can see here in this map, the coloured areas, uh, the tenures that traditional owners had exclusive rights to be able to register a project and to be able to undertake fire management. And so one of the challenges, I guess I would say, is that traditional owners were managing fire up to those hard boundaries that you can see. 
Uh, but on the other side of the boundaries, it was up to the state agency um, or the defence department or the pastoralists to be managing fire on those properties. And so when we first started out, there was um, what I would say challenges in how we partnered with and worked with other landholders in implementing the fire programs um, and who had the right to burn and how close to the boundary we could be burning. Uh, and then over time, it actually transformed those partnerships because people did have to be planning and working together to manage fire across landscapes. As you can imagine, a lot of effort. Uh, and as I mentioned before, the sale of the, the carbon credits and the income generated from that is invested back into fire management and increasing communities' capacity to be able to deliver, you know, uh, landscape scale fire operations. So there was a lot of investment that went into working safely with aircraft, um, field-based training, um, aerial burning operations, incendiary machine uh, operations. And so the income that was generated was reinvested back into people to lift their skill base to be doing community-based fire operations. And you can just see from a few of these photos here that it wasn't just a couple of, you know, officers in an office making decisions about the annual uh, burn plans uh, and fire plans. It was a community all standing around, thinking about last year's, um, last season's fires, uh, reviewing the fire scars, thinking about their cultural sites, thinking about the areas that were really significant to be managing and looking after. And then based on all of those inputs, coming up with a fire plan that they then shared with their neighbours uh, and, and like I mentioned, the other tenure holders to ensure that everybody understood the fire, uh, the fire plan for the season. And you can see just some more photos. So it was elders are involved, the young people who are doing the burning are involved, the neighbouring pastoralists uh, and government national park managers are all involved in the planning process for the fire burning annual fire plan. And what that resulted in, I think you can probably see from this, um, just this map here is a huge shift in the fire regime so the first image, I can't see because your name's, I think it's from 2008 going to 2015. Um, the, a huge shift in hot fire as opposed to early season fire. Um, and we've seen with these projects being registered across Northern Australia, a 50% reduction in wildfire um, across yeah, across the north, which is a huge, which is a huge impact. Um, and more than $90 million is now going in annually into community-based fire through the generation of carbon credits across Northern Australia. I might stop sharing there and invite Sam to talk a bit more about the International Savannah Fire Management Initiative how that links to this Kimberley case study. Thanks, Harry. Let's see if I can get this to work now. Uh, uh, cancel, oh, share. Uh -oh. <laughs> I don't seem, uh, for some reason I'm not able to share my file. Dropbox. Um, hmm. Sam, would you like to maybe start chatting and email me yeah. the file and I'll see if I can get it up? Um, okay, all right. Sorry about that. Well, um, thanks everyone. Um, I wanted to um, pick up where Ari left off and um, I will I won't bother with the PowerPoint. I'll, I'll share it later on. And um, uh, but 
um, in my work, as, as um, Karen mentioned, I've been working in the uh, UN system for, for decades. And um, um, when, um, but when I, and I was mainly working on um, issues to do with biodiversity and human rights and climate change. And, um, and I was mainly working overseas or around the world. So I spent some time in Montreal at the Convention on Biodiversity, working with UNEP and then in a think tank for the United Nations in Tokyo. And, um, <clears throat> but, but on similar issues to, to fire management. But when I heard this story, I realized uh, from that experience from working all around the world that actually uh, this story that was emerging in Australia was um, actually a story which was really relevant for the rest of the world. Because um, as Ari has described, the, the history of uh, many parts of the world which were fire dependent landscapes was a very similar history to the one that Ari described for Northern Australia. And so we found uh, when we, wherever you looked around the world, you would, I knew that there was a, a uh, with, um, there was indigenous management of the landscape in a way which hadn't been recognized and was only beginning to be understood um, in the early noughties. Uh, and, um, and often that was that the main tool was fire and that with European colonization that had been interrupted and, and a fire suppression regime had, had been put in place over the last couple of hundred years. And so we were um, with the, in partnership with the scientists and the rangers, uh, we were able to convince um, the Australian government that, that there was great potential for this uh, experience to be shared um, around the world. And so they in, uh, agreed and invested in a sizable feasibility study, a global feasibility study to see um, what, uh, interest and potential there was for replicating what Ari described um, uh, in not only Australia, but in Africa and Latin America and other fire dependent landscapes. And as you know, um, so we set about doing that and we looked at the literature and found that, you know, there's a, a or that, that similar problems that we're experiencing in Australia with these increase of destructive late dry season fires was also the case all around the world. And you see that in the press nowadays more and more in Brazil and in Bolivia and in California and in Europe, you see a rise of increase in wildfires. And, um, and, and this is predicted to increase in, um, in the years to come with the impacts of climate change. So one of the major impacts of climate change is in fact um, uh, this uh, is that the increased temperatures will dry out these landscapes even more and make them even more fire prone. And one of the interesting things from that research that we found though was actually the, the lack of detailed knowledge about that. So if you have a look at the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change's reports, really actually trying to nail down exactly what the predicted impact of climate change will be on the world's fire regimes is, is very, very difficult. And, and uh, here it is a great opportunity for, for you guys in your research to, 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 to feature that into, the, into these leading international studies. Um, and they appear uh, as, as may, maybe some of you know that they're open access and it's a matter of just engaging um, and submitting your publications to these reports and then engaging in the writing of these reports. And I can, um, I can assure you that the, uh, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change and other kind of important international assessments are really lacking this kind of experience from the fire scientists like yourself. But there is nonetheless a sort of general agreement that, that, that one of the major impacts of climate change will be um, a big increase in uh, fire around the world. And um, to the point that, in fact, which we're already seeing that even rich countries are in no position really to maintain this European based suppression method. And so many other countries around the world are beginning to think about this um, in, in a different way and looking to Australia and the experience in Australia is leading us away to manage uh, the, the increased uh, wildfire 
um, and to manage it on a community based traditional base and revive these traditional practices which were evident in the world. And from the, our detailed feasibility study, therefore, we found many sites around the world, all around the world in North America, in Latin America, in all over Africa, where um, there was great potential for replicating what we had seen emerging in Northern Australia. There was, the landscape was the right, there had been traditional practices which were still um, available and could be revived. The government was interested in this approach, uh, not only because of uh, resources that, um, that we could be generating from the carbon that Ari described in, us in, in Northern Australia, but also more, perhaps more importantly, is that this community-based fire management system is really the only one they can afford in many parts of the world. Um, and so, so for the feasibility study recommended, identified 20 or 30 very promising sites and recommended that the next step should be to prove the concept and actually try and replicate that experience um, that we'd seen in Northern Australia on the ground at, at a site or two. And after deliberations with various stakeholders and partners, in particular the Government of Australia, we identified that we should do that, try this in Botswana in Southern Africa. Um, because it's, Southern Africa is one of the, um, uh, is, the most fire prone continent in the world and is actually the source, as, as I'm sure you know, of something like 70% of the world's fires and greenhouse gas emissions from wildfire. So Southern Africa is a good place to kind of choose a pilot site. And we started work there in 2018 to replicate the kind of things that um, we saw um, and put in place the building blocks that ARI helped build in the Kimberley, but had been built across Northern Australia. So, so one of those building blocks, which is um, the method for uh, measuring the carbon abatement, um, which is um, a very interesting piece of research led by Professor Jeremy Russell Smith and um, Cameron Yates from Charles Darwin University, who we're hoping will be able to talk about that in some detail at a future webinar on this series. But there are many other parts to the peer puzzle, like Ari was talking about building up the community capacities, training programs, getting the um, government policy settings that readjusted so that community-based fire management can be undertaken. Um, and, um, and I'm glad to say that despite the effects of the pandemic over the last 18 months, we've been able to really progress very, very rapidly with this. And, and in fact, we've, uh, the only this week, I was hope, I had a look at, we've published this article in the Journal of Environmental Management. And I was having a look at it a couple of hours ago to see if it actually been published because it's meant to be published today, where we've um, outlined, Jeremy and, and the team have outlined um, how their work to date um, scientifically they've shown that um, we can produce the kind of same results that we've seen in Northern Australia in Botswana and in the region generally. So in the neighboring countries and, and, and this is a very significant step forward for us because it shows us that there's a clear pathway to um, scientifically being able to replicate what's happened in Northern Australia. Now, the other challenges that we face in actually rolling this out, um, like building up the capacity of the community and readjusting the policy settings and setting up uh, the monitoring system and putting in place the fire operations, which Ari described, can be more challenging. But now we know for sure that um, if we are able to replicate those things, we can produce the same kind of outputs that we'd seen in Northern Australia and generate um, all those kind of benefits that we've seen flowing from that. From that. And so um, now looking ahead, um, we've got this great opportunity because we've been in, um, generated this interest from potential investors and donors to scale this pilot site up across around the world. And so now we're now working in, um, in a in a dozen or so countries in Mesoamerica, in Brazil, and in the neighboring countries in Africa, and 
also some countries in Asia to begin this journey as well there. And so uh, it's a great opportunity for those of you who are interested in this um, kind of work to, to, to reach out to Ari and I and Jeremy um, later on, because, because we're going to need every able body to be able to do this in all these countries. And, and um, so it's for, we're very excited to be able to present to you and, and engage your network, because at the heart of this um, idea, it's a, it's a knowledge-based technology. So it's a soft technology and at the heart of it relies upon skilled experts like yourself to be able to, to, to monitor and develop the system that we need in order to uh, measure the impact that the communities make in terms of fire management. I'm sorry I didn't, the PowerPoint uh, didn't work, but um, I'm as I said, I'll happily share some of the pictures um, uh, later on. Uh, thanks. On behalf of everyone listening, I'd just like to say thank you so much, Ari and Sam, for sharing your knowledge and experience with us today. You're both incredible speakers and it is great to hear from you this morning. Uh, it's really amazing for me to see how the initiative's been able to empower Indigenous communities and create these successful synergies, as well as bringing all these economic, social and, and cultural benefits to the people as well. And I also really appreciated hearing your, your personal journeys of how you came to be involved in the initiative and how that's progressed on. So thank you for sharing those with us. So we now have some time to take questions from the audience. If you've got any lingering questions, please do send them in through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and we'll get through as many as we can. So the first one is for Ari. It was just a, um, a clarification question about your... Oh, I see you've answered it through the chat anyway. <laughs> that's great. I'll move on. So uh, the next one's from Simona, who is one of our ESRs. She is asking, what are the challenges of creating and maintaining the co collaborative nature of cultural fire management that you've described? Are the final decisions left with the elders usually, or is the decision-making collaborative too? And also thank you for the presentation. So maybe leave mm -hmm. that open to both of you to, to answer. Sure, I'll, I'll dive in very collaborative process um, for, as you saw in the photos, a lot of people are involved in, and the more people involved actually, the more empowered everybody uh, is and understands the, what happened in last year's fires and the, and the, and the fire scars from the years before, and then what, um, you know, what they want to, the decisions that they make about this year's fire planning and so the elders with the rangers are kind of equally involved in that decision making and it's very much a um, consensus process at the end of the day it is the team implementing the plan that make the final decisions um, but there's not generally huge differences from people in um, you know, planning the strategic burns and a lot of effort is put into linking up the um, fire scars. So a lot of effort and we use helicopters in particular because, you know, in the North Kimberley, it's these huge open landscapes. It's not like um, sort of there's a lot of infrastructure or housing or buildings. And so we use uh, helicopters so that we could fly down low and be able to really track those fire scars um, and strategic burns. So if wildfire did come later in the year, we knew where the fire might jump over those strategic burn lines. Um, so yeah, there was collaborative process, mostly by consensus, but the fire leaders in the team had to make the final decisions. And in the beginning, there was a lot of tension between the other landholders because people were very confronted by Indigenous people starting to, you know, lead community-based fire operations. So we did um, have to overcome quite a bit of local resistance to really building capability of, of community to, you know, reintroduce traditional fire. 
Excellent answer. Thank you. Sam, have you found that is the, the same as you've been looking abroad? You've noticed these similar, I guess, uh, ways of decision making? Um, uh, well, uh, it's uh, very important that it is community led. It's a distinguishing feature of this uh, uh, initiative and the technology generally is that it is, um, it is uh, based on indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge, traditional ecological knowledge. And so, um, so it's very important that they are empowered and to, to lead and make the decisions in this process. But as Eri's touched on, that's a, a complex process as the paper, which I um, is, was published today, or, um, makes clear that this is the critical step though. There's no point, and, and, and in fact, um, for, for many of the governments we're working with, they, they get that nowadays. So um, in particular, like in Botswana, the, the, the attraction for the government is that it actually is empowering communities and they don't have to take prime respons primary responsibility for the fire anymore. So they can see for them, it's very important. And, they, um, and so it's, um, but, but we are really dealing with some very disadvantaged and most vulnerable people usually in these, in these other sites, as indeed in Australia. So the um, Human Development Index for uh, Aboriginals living in Northern Australia is as bad as any of the poorest countries in the world. And, and so we are really dealing with people who need a lot of support um, to show that leadership. But um, but once they've, you know, once they're given the opportunity, a little bit of support, they have stepped up and really grown and shown leadership in Northern Australia. And we're hoping a similar effect can happen in other countries that recognize that it's really challenging, but nonetheless, it's, it's essential. So the, for it to be sustainable and long-term and become business as usual, it's, there's no other way unless they're empowered, the, the, the project, the initiative, the idea, the technology will never take root and will we'll fade as soon as the donors support fades. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Emmanuel. Uh, they ask, could the cultural fire prescribed by the Indigenous Australian community be a model that could be exported uh, to completely different realities in the agricultural and forestry fields for defence on the woods from the latest generation of fires? Do you want me to jump in, Sam? Sure. I think um, it's been really interesting here in Australia because, you know, Northern Australia has a very different um, density of population to Southern Australia. So over um, the 2020 year, and when we saw massive wildfire devastating both uh, New South Wales and Victoria, two key states in Australia, um, very densely populated states. We have started to see uh, the reintroduction of cultural fire in um, more built up areas and agricultural areas. And so there's, they're starting to now in Victoria and New South Wales integrate cultural fire management practices into more forested areas. And there's also the reintroduction of cultural fire and reimagining um, our grains and our food systems. So there's Indigenous groups, Black Duck Foods here in um, Southern Australia that are farming Indigenous grasses and Indigenous um, grains, traditional grains. And to farm those species requires cultural fire which then also um, improves soil condition. And so by reimagining uh, our food systems, reintroducing traditional grains, reintroducing cultural fire practices back into the landscape, you can create these really resilient systems that are very productive. Um, and so we're starting to see that happen here in Australia, which is also applicable to other grasslands um, around the world as well. Thank you very much. Our next question is from Andy Elliott asking, have you connected with the SAV fire research project in South Africa? Uh, 
Um, we have uh, had uh, quite a bit to do with the fire researchers in Southern Africa, um, and they're a very important part of our work in Southern Africa. Um, the, but um, we, and so, so we, are, we are sort of loosely interacting with them. Unfortunately, um, uh, not unfortunately, but the, the situation in South Africa is slightly different and not really um, this technology and this community-based fire management system isn't really applicable for South Africa. So except for maybe in the Kruger National Park up in the north, the rest of South Africa, it's not really going to be very useful. And so it's, um, uh, it's not direct involvement. However, they obviously are scientists have a big impact on the fire research in the region. And so to that extent, we certainly engage with them and um, the particular networks and, and like have, you know, are sort of evolving all the time. And so, um, uh, yeah, we're actively engaged. I can't, I can't speak from personal experience with the, that particular research project, but um, I'm sure if you ask Jeremy um, in the next webinar in months to come, he will be able to answer that. That's great. We're really looking forward to hearing from them as well. Our next question is from Peter Moore. Ari and Sam, very good presentation. Many of the PyroLife researchers are working in social aspects of fire management as against biophysical. Can you describe the time duration and effort needed for the critical engagement with communities and local people that is essential? How long did that process take in the Kimberley region, for example? Great question, Peter. It does take time. Um, you know, what I showed you in, in a 15 minute slide deck is probably 10 years of work. Um, having the base of the community based uh, Indigenous ranges really accelerated the ability uh, and the connection, being able to engage the community because there was a group of full time workers who could facilitate and help to facilitate that engagement. Um, but it's not, it, you know. You don't just go and talk to a community and then expect to be doing fire burning operations with them uh, in, the, in the course of just one year. It's, um, it's a big investment, but worth it in the long run, as you, can, as you saw from those bioscale maps, um, you know, to, to shift the fire regime in a landscape that has had catalytic wildfire coming through for you know, decades uh, and to be able to see that shift happen over a period of 10 years um, and a reduction in wildfire by 50%, um, it makes, you know, you need to make the commitment, that kind of long-term commitment, which is really critical. You can't just sort of have a one-year project and expect to see a, a great outcome from that. It's, um, it's a long-term partnership. Yeah, and respecting community process is really important in that. Yeah, absolutely right. It takes time to build those relationships. But like you said, uh, the, the success speaks for itself, that it's 100% worth it. Mm. Our next question is from Catalina. Uh, it's for Sam asking, could you elaborate on the fire science missing in the IPCC reports? and the process we could follow to share our knowledge in PyroLife project findings there? Sure, um, happy to. Uh, so um, if you, the, the process, um, if you have a look at the, um, the most recent report, Climate Change in Land by the IPCC, and you, and you try and research in the, and you have a look at what the conclusions they came up with um, about fire, you'll find that they're rather anodyne and simple. So um, I have a slide which will highlight the key paragraphs, but um, there are things like the fire weather seasons have lengthened globally between 1979 and 2013, with, and that's with low confidence. So there's not a lot of agreement behind that. These, that's the kind of um, observations they're making based on um, uh, their, their assessment of the existing literature. So, um, uh, so, so what's missing here is um, the, 
the existing literature being brought to the attention of often the assessors. So the assessors uh, and the writers of this report, um, you know, tend to um, emphasize the areas they know and and not and be quite critical about the areas or not include the areas they don't know. So there's the definite biases in the IPCC's outcome as a result. And we've we've assessed and documented that with respect to say, for instance, traditional knowledge. So as many of the scientists in climate change aren't familiar with the role of traditional knowledge in climate change, that, that doesn't feature very significantly. And this is also a case, for instance, you can find quite a significant bias, especially with language reports. So there's very little referencing to uh, uh, language reports, even in Spanish or Chinese or German. So they're quite often missing a lot. Um, so, 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 the, so one of the key things to addressing this then is making sure that there are more publications. Um, uh, and that's where your, your role is really, really important that, that highlight the the data and the findings that you're doing. But then the second thing, which is really important, as I said, is to participate in the process. Um, it's, it's, and that's available to you as scientists as well. That's just a matter of, um, and they have, the way the IPCC generates these reports is basically through the voluntary contribution of, of scientists like yourself. And what you need to do is look on the website. They have, they produce periodic reports and um, they have a global assessment. They're finalizing the sixth global assessment right now, but, but in between, and they take about six or seven years each cycle, but in between their special reports. And what they do is they put out a call for, for contributors um, and you just register and you have to submit your CV and it's reviewed to make sure that you have the skills um, to, as an expert. But um, I'm, I'm sure um, you would qualify, all of you, and it's a great way to, um, to promote your research. It looks very good on your CV, obviously. I see it on many people's CV, and it's a very rewarding experience, which is especially um, nowadays when it's so online because of the pandemic. So, so I think it's a great way to advertise your work and to make connections with good people and help change the world. Thanks, Sam. That's really excellent advice. You often see in policy always calls for more research needed to make conclusions, but we've got a great fire community all over the world and a lot of that research has been done. We just need to, we need to make our voices heard a lot better. So thank you for that advice. Our next question is from Sarah. She said, I really like the marked based mechanisms with the carbon abatement and reinvestment thereof. How important do you think this part is for the sustainability of the project? Critical. Um, the, you know, the from a from an indi indigenous perspective, um, and there's a great video that um, we'll post afterwards, and you can watch. And they really tell the story that, you know, whatever Western um, concepts people want to talk about if it's market-based mechanisms, if it's carbon abatement, um, you know, whatever words and language they want to use for that. What we understand is this is money that's flowing into country that we can make decisions about how we reinvest it into looking after country because when country's healthy, we're healthy. And so Having, um, having that flow of income from the sale of carbon credits and for community to be empowered to make decisions about how they reinvested that back into their annual fire operations. They can be making the decisions about how many cultural elders they wanna take out on country to be camping um, with them while they do the burning, uh, how many youth they wanna be uh, engaged in the training and the fire planning is really empowering because if you have a grant from a government or you, you know, are paid to do fire management, it's generally lowest cost, which doesn't always translate to a community perspective because having 10 old people camping out for a week at a remote fire base is not seen as you know good business sense um, but from a cultural perspective it's critical 
to have elders there to be guiding the young people in their work. Um, so that just gives a, an example of how the flow of revenue direct to communities who then make decisions about how they undertake their fire management um, and community-based fire management is what makes it successful. That's great. Yeah, you're 100% right. Our next question is from Judith, another one of our ESRs. She says, great presentation and initiative. Thanks, Sam and Ari. Could you explain a bit more about how the carbon offset is calculated? Do you save carbon, carbon by preventing fuel accumulation, which would result in higher emissions when it burns? Do you want me? I'll have a go, but really this is a question for the scientists who will hopefully explain it better uh, later on. But simply, what, the, simple, uh, the simple way is that um, the, there's a, um, it's by, um, uh, the, so the, the greenhouse gas emissions are composed mainly of carbon dioxide, methane and nitrous oxides. And if you, um, and, and the idea is that if you can reduce the amount of burning in the year, um, you reduce the amount of gases that are emitted. And um, the calculation is based on the idea that, well, the CO2, which is emitted is reabsorbed in the regrowth next year. And so that's not counted as an, as an offset, but the methane and nitrous oxide, this, the life cycle of those gases, um, is, is much longer. And so that is recognized in um, some in the standards that exist for this kind of idea, both in Australia, but also volunt voluntary standards with uh, international standards as being an offset. So if you can avoid the emission of methane and nitrous oxide, you avoid it being uh, it getting into the atmosphere over decades and and you avoid that, that's the heart of the offset. Now, the other part of it is what Ari showed with the fire scar maps is if you move, um, if you move the regime from an unmanaged one where you get large amount of late dry season fire to a managed one where you have much more early dry season fire and less late dry season fire, you also reduce the amount of basic amount of fire in the system. And so that, that simple reduction of fire, amount of fire in the system um, is also uh, recognized as an offset in terms of the amount of nitrous oxide and methanes. There's also other add-on effects as, Barry, as Ari said, is that it boosts the productivity and biodiversity of the landscape. So, which has which, which is suffered under these, these, these late dry season fire regimes. And so by boosting those productivities, you're actually increasing the woody biomass in the landscape and also the soil carbon. And so um, there's uh, uh, work in Australia to develop standards on that where they're measuring the soil carbon and measuring the woody biomass increase. Uh, and that's another source of, of offsets. It's, it's, a much, it's a much trickier um, scientific exercise and it's been the subject of a lot of um, heated discussion between the scientists as, as to exactly how you measure that bioaccumulation. And so, um, uh, and hasn't really been, the, the standards being developed in Australia isn't really very practical. Um, and so none of the rangers or ranger groups have taken it up, um, but, but it's, it's in fact, that, that bioaccumulation is potentially a um, source of more carbon credits than the abatement of fire. So it's, a, it's a, something we were working hard on and trying to find a solution to in order to uh, double or triple the amount of carbon credits you can generate from the activities which the range is already doing. Excellent, thank you. I see that there have been some links posted in the chat. Uh, Ari has shared some resources with you all. I really encourage you to watch the, the YouTube video. I watched it earlier this morning and it, it was excellent. Uh, really showed you a glimpse into to what is being done on these projects. And I will just take a quick minute to 
say one of the questions that had been answered earlier. I'm not sure if everyone was able to see it in the chat, but Alexander Held asked, uh, what uh, incendiary machine do you use? And Ari clarified that it was the uh, rain dance incendiary machines in the squirrel helicopter and light planes. So I see that we're coming towards the end of our session. If there's no more burning questions, we'll um, wrap that up now. I did just want to say, uh, Ari and Sam, what is the best way to contact you? Um, you mentioned there's, that it would be great to get in contact and Sam, it would also be great to, to see your manuscript when it comes out. Uh, what's the best way to do that? Um, well, me, uh, mm. yeah, email. It's not my manuscript. I am one of the authors, but it's been the lead author's Jeremy. Uh, but it's it's in the Journal of Environmental Management with open access. We've paid for open access, so I, uh, it should be there tomorrow. Um, but if you can't find it, drop me a line and I'll email, email it back to you. I've only got a sort of a, the penultimate version of it. I don't have the pub. I've got a, a few typos in it. Um, so but I'm happy to share that with people if they can't find it. That's great. I'll be keeping an eye out for the, that. That would be great to read. And ESRs and anyone else in the presentation today, if you've got any more questions for Ari and Sam, uh, drop them an email. You'll be able to find it on their project website, I assume. So I'd just like to take this last opportunity to thank Ari and Sam to, for presenting today. It's been just great for us to be able to connect and learn from you. And I'm looking forward to following how the initiative progresses and maybe even PyroLife becoming more involved with you guys. That would be great. A big thank you also to all the people behind the scenes who are responsible for bringing the great webinar series together. And of course, thank you to everyone who's joined us today. So this brings today's webinar to a close and we look forward to seeing you all next month for our next webinar looking at wildfire and flood risk in the Mediterranean. And you can find all the details for that on the PyroLife website. So take care for now and see you all next time.